Hey everybody and welcome to Breaking Biotech. Thanks for being with me here today. My name is Matt and I have an awesome show for everyone. We're going to be doing an update on the COVID-19 situation. I'm sure everyone is sick about hearing the same old stuff, so this is going to be a little bit different. We're going to talk about a couple of the drugs that are in the pipeline that might help out with the COVID-19 disease, and we're also going to talk about a potential vaccine that could be a real investment play. So if you like the show, you can help me out by clicking the like or the subscribe button, and you can also leave me a comment wherever you listen to this podcast. So like I said, you know, we're in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is continuing to escalate. In uh, California here, we're doing okay. The shelter in place seems to be um, instituted, and personally in San Diego, we've seen the beaches and the parks officially closed. So that continues to escalate, but you know, I'm doing okay out here. Things aren't that bad as of now. The situation does seem to be getting worse, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. And I also want to talk about a few pipeline updates that we heard from some pretty cool companies. So let's start with that. And the first company I want to talk about is Cassava Sciences, ticker symbol SABA for those who don't know. But I did do a video on them maybe three or four videos ago, maybe two months. And uh, we're waiting for their phase 2B data to come out. And this is a... I think 28 day trial with their drug PTI-125 that is supposed to change the course of the disease in Alzheimer's patients. So what we heard is a pipeline update and their CEO said that their clinical programs show no signs of slowing down. This is good. I think a lot of people were concerned in general of all biotech that, you know, this virus, it really does get out of hand. And I'm talking about SARS-CoV-2. It could really interfere with regular clinical trials if say half the patients get the virus and have to undergo treatment for flu that's not ideal when you're trying to just look at a control in a test group. So anyway, related to cassava, apparently their clinical programs are not slowing down and their phase 2B trial completed patient enrollment as well as dosing. And this is as of March 2020. And they mentioned that there were no safety issues found, which is a good thing. And then they also said that the company expects to announce top line results approximately mid-year of 2020. And then they also announced that they're going to initiate a one-year open label study Um, of the drug. So if this happens to not work out, you know, there is a chance that the drug could affect patients in one year's time in case the 28-day treatment isn't quite enough. So uh, the details of of the trial, definitely check out my older video on that. I I took a position in the fives, I believe, and I think the company is now trading in the threes. So I might add a little bit to the position because I did only start scaling in. And I'm really looking forward to seeing this readout here in mid-2020 because if it is positive, the stock could increase substantially. So that's what I'm betting on here. So let's move on to DBV technology, ticker symbol DBVT. They're an allergy company that is kind of a competitor to Amune, even though some people would not consider them necessarily competitors because one obviously is uh, much less effective than the other. So the, the issue with DBVT is that their skin patch, their Viaskin product, it is less effective than Amune's oral immunotherapy. The benefit of that is that there are significantly fewer side effects, but the issue is the FDA really wants to see that there is efficacy and a benefit to patients taking this drug or this therapy in order to approve the product. So we saw that Amune got FDA approval finally, and that was nice to see. And the concerns there were that the product does have some side effects associated with it. DBVT, on the other hand, does not have many side effects, but they do happen to have a lack of efficacy. So what happened is the FDA identified questions regarding the efficacy of its biologics license application for Viaskin peanut in patients with peanut allergy. As a result, the Allergenic Products Advisory Committee, APAC, meeting to discuss the BLA will no longer take place as previously scheduled. So this led to a big drop in the stock, and DBVT has struggled off and on dealing with the FDA. They had some manufacturing issues uh, last year, maybe a year more than that. I, I don't quite remember, but I am concerned of this and I don't think it's worth buying the dip necessarily. If they're not able to show efficacy, it's going to be a real problem. Now, they do have some data coming out soon that could show that their product does have more efficacy than their other trials showed. So if you're looking for a high risk play, you could do that. I am interested in the space, this oral or skin-related allergy desensitization. So I'm keeping my eye on both companies, and they have taken a big hit in this recent downturn we've had. So I'm gonna be keeping my eye out on them. All right, the next company I wanna touch on is Viking Therapeutics, and it's been a long time since I talked about them. 
They are a Nash company that has been kind of slow to bat, but they might have the best in class drug for Nash. It's a thyroid receptor beta agonist that does really well in lowering liver fat. So the news that we got is that their board has authorized a stock repurchase program whereby the company can repurchase up to $50 million in stock over two years. And this came as the market was really coming down. And I'm kind of surprised because oftentimes these small biotech companies really struggle to raise cash because their stock price is so depressed as it's being sold off. But for some reason, Viking has decided that it's more important for them to kind of artificially increase the stock price by doing a share buyback. So as of de December 2019, they had $257.6 million in cash. They are presenting data from their 2018 trials at conferences, which seems like kind of a waste of resources to me. I think we've all really seen the data and digested it. I don't know what they think they're going to get by presenting that data. It's one thing to kind of present the updated data, but we don't really have much of that. So for me, this is kind of a strange move, and I would have much rather them use that $50 million towards anything else that would either increase the likelihood of their pipeline candidates being developed or you know, hiring people that are good at developing Nash candidates, but instead they're just buying back stock. So this is not a very encouraging move to me. We're, we're still in the midst of this phase 2B trial, and we're waiting for that data, but one thing I wanted to note is that I looked at the clinicaltrials.gov symbol for, for their trial, and it looks like their primary outcome is actually 12-week MRI data and analyzing liver fat content. The trial started in November of 2019, so there's actually a chance that we could see this data in the next six months or so, at least before the end of 2020. So I'm kind of keeping my eye on that, and for that reason, I'm not selling any of the stock I have, even though I've taken quite a hit in the position. The secondary endpoint for this trial is 52-week resolution of steatohepatitis via histology. So that's the actual biopsy of the liver where they're actually going to be able to score it and evaluate you know, whether or not NASH has been resolved to some capacity given the metrics that the FDA wants them to look at. But the endpoint we're going to see is uh, this 12-week MRI data of liver fat content. And we can be pretty confident that liver fat is going to go down the patients in this trial are biopsy confirmed NASH patients, so the bar is raised a little bit higher than their phase 2A trial that was just done using NAFLD patients, which is a milder form uh, before you get to NASH. It's just a fatty liver disease problem. So that's where we're at with Viking. The last company I want to talk to before we get to our highlighted story is Axone Therapeutics, and we heard that they are accelerating the trial completion for AXS05. I have a typo there in Alzheimer's disease agitation to Q2 rather than Q3 2020. I hadn't really talked about the disease agitation trial because I think it's their lesser important one. I'm much more excited about the treatment resistant depression readout that should be happening in the next week or so. And there's also gonna be a readout for AXS07 in migraine. Those are gonna be really big movers for the stock. And now we can just add another one that in Q2 we're gonna see this Alzheimer's disease agitation. AXSM is the ticker for Axome. It's been all over the place throughout this whole downturn in the market. And I have taken another position or I kind of doubled down with what I had because I kind of bought it at the top. But I, I do think that they have a good chance of seeing a positive outlook in TRD, treatment resistant depression. And if it is positive, I think it'll be a big mover for the stock because physicians really struggle to treat TRD. So this would be huge for them. So that's kind of where we're at with Axome. And I'm looking forward to the data in the next little while. All right, so let's get to the feature story of today. And what I wanna talk about first before I get into the potential therapeutics is the escalation of COVID-19. So for those who don't know, which I'm sure you all do, COVID-19 is the disease caused by the influenza virus called SARS-CoV-2. It's a, amongst a family of coronaviruses, but this is a novel one that happens to be pretty infectious. So we've seen in the last two weeks explosion of cases around the world. I think we're at maybe 350,000 cases across the world, which most of those now have been largely outside of China where the cases are spreading. We've also seen that hospital systems around the world have been overwhelmed, which is something I kind of brought up in my last video. And if we look at the numbers right here, we can see that China is relatively stable, although I have heard some people talk about how the China's just hiding the numbers, and some of the interesting studies we've been seeing is that 
they've actually monitored the amount of cell phone usage that's going on in China. And in the last month or two, there's been a decrease in the millions of people who are no longer using their cell phones. So you can imagine that China might be wanting to hide the number of cases they have just to make it seem like they have it contained. But I'm kind of suspicious. Unfortunately for Europe and the United States, we have been exploding in cases, and I think that's largely due to the lack of testing that was rolled out pretty much until now. So the CDC has finally been rolling out the tests in the United States, and that's starting to see a big positive effect. We're starting to know where the cases are and how to respond to them. And we're also seeing measures such as shelter in place in a number of states so that we can kind of curb this explosion of cases as it happens. One thing that I want to note is that it seems like Italy is around two to three weeks ahead of the USA, so I'm really using them as a benchmark to look and see what the USA is going to become in the next little while. So we can see here that at 60,000 cases, and by the time this video is uploaded, I'm sure there'll be more cases because I'm on like a bit of a bit of a delay, but Italy's population, 0.1% has been infected with the virus. And I think that in two weeks, the USA is likely to be there. So that means we're going to get like a tenfold increase in cases in the next two weeks in the United States. And I think that's very possible. So something to be mindful of, and I'm sure we'll get this under control, but we really need to continue these intense measures of social distancing and potentially even something more severe like a lockdown. And I know we've been seeing across the country these pictures of the National Guard being kind of quietly deployed in the United States, and there's a good chance that we might be forced to deal with something like that. So I'm keeping my eye out on that, but this is kind of where we're at in the COVID situation. It is a big deal, and the markets are definitely responding negatively to it. Now, in terms of what the biotech sector and pharma sector are trying to do to curb it, uh, this nice article from BioCentury, which is a couple weeks old now, showed a nice little graph of the different readouts we can expect. And I know you can't really see it on the screen, but just some of them to be mindful of is the remdesivir. We're going to see a readout on the 3rd of April and the 10th of April. And then some other ones that are kind of interesting is this favipavivir. And then on April 30th here, we see a big readout of trials, but I think they just don't know when the date is that these numbers are going to come out. But... You know, some that are interesting is the hydroxychloroquine, and we have already seen some data on that, and I'm going to touch on that study. So, of the therapeutics that are coming out, and really the biotech sector has been mobilized pretty substantially to focus on these drugs. And I think, you know, there's some incentives from the government, there's going to be financial incentives, and a lot of companies are putting their best foot forward to see where they can use their expertise and come up with some way to help out the public. So the most popular ones that have come out that I've heard of is the hydroxychloroquine and the azithromycin trial. And we're going to talk about that French study that came out a little while that had a lot of people excited, a lot of people kind of cautiously optimistic. I also want to talk about Gilead's remdesivir, which is an antiviral that was tested in Ebola with mixed results. And then I want to talk about Moderna's mRNA1273, which is a potential vaccine for the disease. So let's first talk about hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, a couple of uh, difficult words to say. So the study that was published a little while ago is, the author was Gautre et al. 2020, and they're a French group that took 28 patients and they treated them with either hydroxychloroquine or hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Now, the limitations of the study really are just the small N number. So there were only seven people in the hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin group, and then the other patients were kind of split between the control and the hydroxy group only. So what we saw was that at day six, all of the patients that were treated with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin were PCR negative for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So this would be used as a treatment to patients that have the disease and are showing symptoms, treat them with the hydroxy and the AZ, the virus goes away, and they're good to go. This is a mix of patients at different stages of their disease, and ideally you would want to catch people at the same part of their disease or at least exhibiting the similar symptoms. So, you know, where are they at their disease? And if there's only seven patients in one of the treatment groups, you know, were, were they skewed in one direction or the other? And ideally you want all the patients to be in the same stage of the disease when you do the treatment. You can't always do that, of course, and we're still kind of learning more about the disease as we go, but that's something I'd keep in mind. 
The other thing is that they didn't show any CT values. And I saw a bunch of threads on Twitter talking about QRT-PCR. And that's the way that they tested these patients for positivity of the virus. And now we're showing a very binary thing here with the patient that either is positive or is negative. But really, the QRT-PCR technique, it's a, it's a range. It's not a binary uh, readout. And they had to make judgment calls on what they would consider a negative test and what they would consider a positive. But really what they could have done is shown the difference in CT values. CT just means cycle threshold, and that's really the level at which the exponential curve is about to happen when you're doing a PCR reaction. So you can use the software in the program to show when that is on each sample, and the lower the CT value, basically, the higher amount of target is in your sample. And in this case, that would be viral particles. So I'm kind of surprised they didn't show the raw CT values in like a chart form and show the difference in CT values from when they started treatment to when they ended treatment. But it is what it is, and I think everybody's kind of in a rush to get their data out, and this group is obviously no exception. So they decided to make judgment calls on what they would consider positive and negative and put out the data as it is. But I think we're very early in this stage, and I'm looking forward to seeing data with kind of a larger group because, you know, you see these headlines now of people dying after they've been treated with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, which, you know, anecdotally isn't very useful, but if it was in a trial setting, we'd be able to make these broad claims about whether or not it's something we should be rolling out to patients or not. Now, something that might be a little more effective here is Gilead's remdesivir. And Gilead has been known for their strong antiviral portfolio. They've been very good at developing hepatitis C, and they also have a portfolio in hepatitis B. And one that happens to show some effectiveness in Ebola, as well as this COVID-19, is remdesivir. So the reason why they're going with this is that remdesivir has already been tested in a lot of different trials, so it's very easy to just repurpose this drug into a phase three for people that are suffering with COVID-19, and then they can pretty much you know, run these phase three trials, and then the FDA can evaluate whether or not it should be approved. Now, there are other drugs that Gilead could use towards this disease. They have a very large portfolio of different potential antivirals, so the story might not end at Gilead's remdesivir, and something to keep in mind when, when we're talking about this and as we move forward in the story. But the other thing that's going on is that remdesivir was being offered in a compassionate use setting. I think Maybe earlier today or yesterday, they announced that they were stopping that program because there's been such an overwhelming demand. But because of that, we've been able to get a, an insight into three patients that were using remdesivir. And the patients did end up recovering, but all three of them had gastrointestinal symptoms as well as elevated immunotransferase enzymes. So this shows that there's some kind of liver thing going on, whether there's significant damage or not, we're not too sure. With some of these drugs, they might be um, a little toxic to the liver, and when that happens, the liver cells might break or die, and they'll release these aminotransferase enzymes that can be measured in the blood. So when this happens, is a bit of a concern, but really with only three patients, it's a little bit early to, to make broad statements, but we can get an idea into what we're looking at. And to me, this just makes it seem like people who have pre-existing liver conditions are likely not going to be able to take remdesivir. But the other side of that is that most of the people who need the remdesivir because they're suffering from COVID-19 are likely suffering from comorbidities. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So the other thing I wanted to mention is one paper from Wang et al. in Cell Research that they published a little while ago. And this is the thing that got some people excited too, was that in a cell culture model in vitro, they showed that when you treated Vero E6 cells with SARS-CoV-2, but also added remdesivir, you would get a good inhibition of infection, and there was also minimal cytotoxicity here. Now, this is an in vitro assay, so it's not really comparable to an in vivo setting, but the other thing to keep in mind is that Vero E6 cells are a kidney cell line from vervet monkey, and the cell line's also immortalized, so there's some characteristics about the cell line that don't make it a perfect model for humans, but it is a step in the right direction to say that remdesivir does have an effect on SARS-CoV-2. So this is positive data, but we are going to want to wait and see what these phase three trials look like. So the other thing from an investment standpoint, you know, we really need to ask ourselves, how much will this indication actually increase cash flow to Gilead? 
And the other things to keep in mind are, you know, who's going to pay for it? And will the government announce that they're going to take the drug from Gilead and that they're mandated to produce it for the greater benefit of society? And I think those things are entirely possible, given the situation that we're in. Now, Gilead traded on Friday. They closed at 73.26, and they're not too far off that now. And their market cap is $92 billion. So even if you expect them to gain another $1 billion in cash flow for the short amount of time that the virus is here, and that's where kind of the art of investing comes in, how much is this going to meaningfully contribute to the business's bottom line? So I'm not too sure that this is going to be a significant thing. I think that if the virus does get under control, any income that would come from this is going to evaporate immediately. On the other hand, though, if you look at vaccine income, if we need to prevent every single person who hasn't been infected with this disease from getting it, there's going to be a real market opportunity here for a vaccine. So this is a clever segue to talk about Moderna and their vaccine candidate, mRNA-1273. And for those who don't know, this is an mRNA vaccine against SARS-CoV-2, and it encodes for the pre-fusion stabilized form of the spike protein of the novel coronavirus. And this protein is essential in the binding of the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 on the human cell membrane. So this is how the virus is actually able to infect human cells in the lung. And if we can create a vaccine that will target that, presumably our bodies can be able to fight it off without needing to be infected and deal with all the symptoms of the normal disease. So some interesting things about mRNA vaccines, and you know, when I was thinking about this, and I think a lot of people that had thought about Moderna, they didn't really get it, and they think that you know, you can't just put mRNA into a person or on cells, it doesn't work. In my postdoc in a previous life, if I just put mRNA on cells in culture or in a mouse, nothing would happen. And the reason for that is that mRNA or RNA in general is extremely prone to degradation. And what you would need to do is put it in some sort of vector, some sort of compound that could be taken up by the cell. When I originally looked at this company, I was a little bit suspect, and they did get a lot of flack on the bio Twitter community, but what they're actually using is a lipid nanoparticle formulation. And what I think these are, and there isn't too much information on the company website about these, is it's a lipid particle, like it is in the name, and inside that they can put, uh, they can fill it up with mRNA such that when they infuse this into a patient or put it on cells, the cells will take it in like it would endocytose some kind of exosome or some kind of vesicle in normal cell physiology. And then once the mRNA gets into the cell, it can be used by the ribosomes to produce the protein that it encodes. So that's how I think this actually works. I do believe they are trying just naked mRNA in some of their trials, but for the purposes of this vaccine in this video, we're talking about mRNA that's inside a lipid nanoparticle that is then infused into a patient. And so some of the benefits actually of mRNA vaccines are that there's no infectious particles that you need to produce. There's also no risk that you're gonna integrate this mRNA or any DNA into the host genome. With DNA vaccines that exist, there is that risk that you give a plasma to somebody and it might behave in such a way that it would actually integrate, which means go into the actual host genome itself. And related to that is you don't need to worry about it crossing the nuclear membrane. That's another downfall of, I think, DNA vaccines. And then the other thing is that it's very quick to generate. And the reason for that is you just need the DNA sequence and then you can come up with some targets and go ahead and treat people. If you need to come up with protein and you know, manufacture a peptide or something like that, you have to go through a lot more stringent manufacturing in order to get that protein QC'd and everything. And you have to do QC with this mRNA vaccine as well, but I think there's fewer hurdles to getting a functional product than you would need to if it was a traditional vaccine where actually giving somebody a kind of protein or peptide. Now, the downside is that mRNA does seem to induce a robust innate response. And I have here, this is taken from a review I was looking at, it includes the production of cytokines and chemokines, such as IL-12, as well as TNF, at the injection site. So there are usually injection site reactions to any vaccine, but it's important to note that mRNA vaccines also do this. The other downside is that there is low stability. So like I mentioned, mRNA is very prone to degradation. So keeping in mind that the stability of the mRNA is going to be a factor, and you want that stability to be maintained as long as possible, in order to get as much protein product as possible in the host cell.
And then finally the downside is you need to optimize to ensure you get enough antigen expression, enough to get immunization. So it's one thing to be able to control how much protein or peptide you give somebody in order to ensure they can get an immunization response, but it's another thing when you need to optimize, you know, how many micrograms of mRNA do I need to put in this lipid nanoparticle that are going to survive the trip all the way to the host cells so that the host cells can actually produce the protein for you. So there is some iteration that needs to go on before that can be effective. So I looked in Moderna's portfolio and actually found that they had done this with the H10N8 influenza and H7N8 influenza virus. So this paper was really illuminating to me and it showed how they can actually generate these vaccines and they're able to get a response in people. So this is a phase one trial where they generated mRNA vaccines very similar to what, they, what they're doing with mRNA 1275 and they treated healthy people with this mRNA vaccine and then they evaluated whether or not the serum from these patients was effective in the hemagglutinin inhibition assay as well as the micronutrilizing assay. And these are two assays that immunologists use to evaluate the level or the titer at which the infection is blocked. So I'm going to go through this in a little bit of detail, but basically once the treatment happens, you're given the vaccine, and then after a period of time, the doctor is going to collect blood from you, and what they're going to do is take that blood and separate it from the cells. So they're just going to get the serum or the plasma. I've read articles that say both work. And what they're gonna do is a serial dilution with that plasma. They're gonna take it, they're gonna dilute it by one and two. They're then gonna dilute that by one and two and then dilute that by one and two. And then what they're gonna do is they're gonna mix that with the virus and treat it on a plate of cells. And what this is gonna do is if the serum is able to block infection, that means that the cells are gonna be undisturbed on the plate. In this example here that I'm showing, I'm just going to make that bigger, is that in this example, at a dilution of 1 and 2 of your serum or the patient's serum, they see that the viral infection is completely blocked and they're using a cell stain here to look at cells. And you can do this under the microscope or whatever stain that can, that can stain healthy intact cells. When they dilute the blood even further by another half, they see that the virus is unable to infect these cells. But then what they see is that at a dilution of 1 and 8, the virus is capable of infecting cells on that plate. So what this means is that your blood would have a titer of 4 in its ability to neutralize the viral infection. So if we go to the actual data that we see, and the only difference between the hemagglutinin assay and the micronutrilizing assay is that one is done with red blood cells and the other is done with epithelial cells. The source of those cells can vary from trial to trial, but you want to pick a good cell type that is representative of the person or the model at which you're taking the blood from, if that makes sense. So for the HAI trial here, they showed that at 100 microgram dose, they were able to get the geometric mean titer to 68.8, which is about a 10 times increase from the placebo. So that's very, very positive. And what they also did is they did the percent of participants that reached a titer of higher or equal to 1 in 40. And what they saw was that at that 100 microgram dose, 100% of participants reached a titer of 1 in 40. And this titer here is supposedly enough to provide seropositivity and protection against that virus in day-to-day -day life. Now from the micronutrilizing perspective, so these are epithelial cells and not red blood cells, they saw that in the 100 microgram dose, the geometric mean titer was 38.8, and this is compared to the placebo at 5.9. And what they showed here is that the percent of participants that reached a titer of 1 to 20 or higher was 87% in the 100 microgram group compared to the placebo that was 5.8%. All that is to say that these vaccines are possible and that they were able to develop them in these two different influenza viruses. So it's quite possible that they're gonna be able to do it in the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, is it the correct mRNA that they chose? I'm not too sure, but they were able to generate a candidate product and they have been treating patients in a phase one trial. So to look at Moderna in more depth, they were trading on Friday at 28.8 a share, and I don't think they're too far off that now. 
They have a market cap of $9.28 billion, and this is all early stage biotech. They haven't gotten a phase three success yet, but they do have a trial they're gonna start in phase three soon. So they have a wide variety of different mRNA candidates, and I just showed this on the right here that there's a number of them. They have their core programs, and then they have also exploratory programs in collaboration with other companies. They have an operating expense of $605 million in 2019, and this is similar in 2018, but their net current assets are actually $1 billion. So they do have a lot of cash on hand that should last them all the way through to the end of 2020 and probably even into 2021. Now, the completion of the phase one trial for mRNA 1273 is going to happen. They're estimating in June 1st of 2020. We'll see if they can hold true to that, but if they're able to get a positive outcome here, I think the stock is going to kind of go crazy, and it's already seen a very big increase. It was really a hated company throughout most of 2019, and then just ended up catching a bid once the advancement of their program started happening. But then once they announced they were going to do a trial in SARS-CoV-2, the, the value of the company really exploded. So this is going to be a very important date on whether or not the company is going to maintain this value or not. They also have a readout of mRNA 1647, which is their CMV vaccine, and that's a phase two interim data readout that should happen in Q3 of 2020. Now, I wanted to try and compare this to kind of prior epidemics and see whether or not it was actually worth investing in any one of these companies. And I looked at the avian flu and the swine flu crisis, and these happened in the late 2000s and early 2010s. And we saw that the H1N1, which was the swine flu pandemic, Novartis was actually mobilized to create a vaccine, and they did so. And what they ended up doing is selling $1.3 billion worth of vaccine in 2010. And then Sanofi Pasteur for the avian flu, which was H5N1, they made $192 million in 2008. Now, you can talk about the relative differences in which one was considered more serious by government, but... It seems like it's kind of a risk to assume that just playing based off of a pandemic vaccine is a good way to take a position in the company. But what I think is more valuable when you're thinking about these is whether or not this is going to become a government mandated vaccine, a lot like polio or rubella, a lot of these things that all children have to get. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, take Sanofi Pasteur, their yearly revenue in influenza vaccines is $1.9 billion a year. Now that is substantial revenue that actually justifies Moderna being traded at $9.28 billion today. So it's for that reason that I think people are willing to pay that price for Moderna is that this thing could become a cyclical virus that sticks with us for decades. And one way to combat that is to come up with an effective vaccine. And if Moderna has it in their hands right now, that definitely merits the current valuation that they have. Now, would I buy at 28.8? I don't think so. But if they drop down to say $5 billion valuation, it could be worth making a, a long shot bet that this is the vaccine that is gonna become the standard for all people really, because you can imagine that the governments are gonna to want to get the population to have herd immunity for this so that any kind of epidemic of SARS-CoV-2 again isn't able to do as much damage as it did this time because we're seeing estimates now of substantial losses in economic productivity. And what the government is likely to do is to issue this vaccine and force people to take it. Now, can they actually force people? Maybe, maybe not. But they can create incentives that force a large portion of the population to take that. And if it's sponsored by the government, it's going to be very easy for them to pay for it and sponsor Moderna in this effort. So for that reason, Moderna could have value at $9.28 billion, I'm not sure I would buy up here, but you know, with all the wild swings we're seeing in the market, I could see that if it dips to you know, $5 billion, $4 billion valuation, I would consider taking a position. So that's what I have on Moderna. And in the next few weeks, I'm going to be keeping my eye out on the Axome trial for treatment-resistant depression. That's going to be a big mover for the stock. I'm excited about that. I am going to be also keeping an eye out on Ameren, which should have their patent litigation decision at the end of the month. That, I also think, is going to be a big mover for the stock. It has been a brutal month for biotechs. Ameren has not been immune to the downturn that we've seen, but I do think that a positive decision there would really 
solidify their position as having control of this IP such that they're going to be able to generate a significant amount of income from Vasipa. Other things we need to look at this week are continued fallout from the COVID-19 breakout. We saw that unemployment claims have increased substantially. We also saw that credit spreads have widened. Everybody's asking where the bottom is. And for me, I am looking towards Italy, specifically in Europe, on where we're going to expect to see the USA in two to three weeks from now. So I'm estimating that the USA numbers are going to begin to look a lot, lot worse in the next little while since testing has finally been rolled out and it's all being kind of rolled out at once. But is that going to be a good representation of the active cases? No, it's likely to be an underestimate. But my like Twitter fin twit estimate is that the topping of cases is going to happen in late April, early May. And around that time, we're going to see a bottoming of the market. And that doesn't mean we're not going to see a bear market rally in the next little while and then a further drop because that's totally possible. But I think that we're going to start to finally have this thing under control in late April, early May. And, you know, I have no idea if that's actually going to be true. That's kind of my prediction as a keyboard jockey over here at the Breaking Biotech headquarters. The other thing to keep in mind is that government intervention is going to be happening throughout this whole time, and it's going to lead to wild market swings. We've already seen interest rates being dropped to zero and the announcement of QE. We're also going to start to see bailouts and relief packages and all sorts of funny stuff that could lead to wild market swings. Yeah, so for that reason, definitely be careful when you're trading out there. I am definitely erring on the side of holding cash than I am you know, going out and buying stuff very quickly, even though I have taken an increase in certain positions. So with that, let's get to my portfolio, which has been a nightmare to say the least. And it's funny when your green in your conditional formatting in Excel is at positions that are at like negative 30 or negative 18 because everything this year has been brutal. Basically, a lot of the moves I've done is scaled into some companies that I already owned. I did take a position in Trillium and I am down on that position. I sold my Aspirion. I covered my ODT short, which... You know, if you've been looking at the market, I definitely got cold feet and covered my short. I could have made a lot more money. That would have been helpful for me in this downturn. But I, uh, yeah, I really thought that we were going to see a bigger bounce than we did when I did cover that. So I covered at the probably one of the worst possible times, but I did end up making three, four hundred dollars in the trade. So happy to see that I added to my Regenix bio position as well as my Axome position here. So. For the year, I believe I'm down 30% in change. I'm very close to the Dow Jones, which has also suffered tremendously in this time, but we're really down all across the board. The tech sector seems to be the one that has held up the best, but I don't think that that's going to hold true once we actually do bottom. I think the supply chains in China are threatened, given this whole situation, and the geopolitics involved could lead to a real change-up of the supply chains. In terms of volatility, we are still very high. Volatility has gone down in the first day or two in the market, so we'll see how that actually plays out. But this is where I'm at right now and uh, still holding strong. But I want everybody to be safe out there. I appreciate everybody who's been giving me some support. But with that, I'm going to wrap it up. So thanks again, everybody, and we'll see you next time.